Then I'll write over there in Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Uh, just to start out with verse number 2 in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Uh, some interesting verses here um, that say some things that are contrary to what a lot of people in the world would probably think to be true. Look at verse 2 of Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. There it says, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that, the house of feasting, is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to heart. Verse 3, Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. So here in this, these verses here, we see a claim that say sorrow and sadness and mourning, things that we look at is a bad thing, are actually better than happiness. These things have a they have benefits to them that happiness uh, cannot give, and this is even something that uh, we see here later in Ecclesiastes chapter seven and verse fourteen. It says, "In the day of prosperity, be joyful; but in the day of adversity, consider. God also hath set one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him." So God has given us here. It's saying um, it's saying that mourning and sadness is better than happiness. But God has given us in life good times and He's given us bad times, each for a purpose, and each so we can learn special things from. And it says in the day of adversity, consider. And the Bible is claiming that there are, there are things that can be learned and gained from sorrow that we cannot gain in happiness. And so this evening, uh, or this afternoon, uh, the title of the sermon is The Gift of Sorrow. And I'd like to give you five advantages, according from the Word of God, on experiencing sorrow that happiness cannot give. And in fact, you know, we're celebrating uh, Christmas today and tomorrow, and this is even something, you know, God, it's a part of life. Sorrow is a part of life. It's, it's something that must happen, and you don't have to turn there. We're going to go to this verse later and learn something else from it. But uh, in Luke chapter 2, we read it this morning, but in Luke chapter 2, when Simeon uh, is blessing uh, baby Jesus, he says specifically to Mary, it says, And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary. So he's specifically speaking to Mary here. He says, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. That's a bad thing. And for a sign which shall be spoken against. And then he says this to her, he says, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And we're going to look at this later in the sermon, but here just as an overview, overview he's telling her, you know, this, this child is, is obviously we know Jesus Christ came to, to pay for the salvation of all mankind, and there was enormous good that came out of that, but there was some sorrow that had to happen. There was going to be some persecution. There was going to be people speaking against. Yes, there was going to be many rising again. There's going to be many people who were saved, but like we talked about this morning, when you have division, there are some people who will also fall. And he says to Mary here, he says, A sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, speaking to just the personal sorrow that she will face of seeing her son go through everything he did and all the suffering that he did. So even in the Christmas story, there had to be sorrow in order for good to come. So turn to Psalm chapter 119. Psalm chapter 119. So like I said this evening, we're talking about the gift of sorrow. Uh, and five advantages of experiencing it, of going through it. You know, we're going on a new year here, and, you know, if, uh, if you didn't experience any sorrow in the past year, maybe you will in, in this coming year. Hopefully, you know, hopefully not entirely, but it's a part of life. It does happen. Uh, the first thing this evening, or this afternoon, sorry, I want to look at about sorrow is that we see that sorrow teaches. Sorrow teaches teaches. You're there in Psalm 119. Look at verse 71. The Bible says this, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. Why? Why is it good? Affliction's bad. It's painful. No one wants to go through it. Why is it good? He says that I might learn thy statutes. This person here, I, I believe David wrote Psalm 119, but we don't know that for sure. But here this person says uh, he went through sorrow. He went through affliction. But he describes it as a good thing because of not the experience of going through it, but rather what he learned from it in the end. Turn to 2 Peter 1, 5. 2 Peter 1, verse 5. While you're turning there, I'll read you Romans 5, 3 through 4. Uh, this is a verse a pastor reads often. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, 
and experience hope. How are you, how are you going to get experience without tribulation? You're not. There are certain things that in order to fully understand and to fully learn, you have to go through some bad things to get there. There was a sermon from uh, Dr. Jack Hiles I remember listening to last year that I thought was interesting. The, the title of the sermon was God Still on the Throne. And the premise of his sermon was that uh, many people, when bad times come, um, and we'll look at this a little more later, but when bad times come, uh, some people will say, well, if it's not turning out the way I thought, God must not be in it. If it doesn't seem like God's blessing it, God must not be in it. If it's difficult, God must not be in it. And his premise of the sermon, uh, just for context, was that, no, even if things are hard, even if things are difficult, God is still on the throne. That doesn't mean that God's not in it. Uh, maybe you just have to go through some difficulty uh, to, to get there. And there's a quote I want to read you from that sermon where he kind of describes his mentality a lot of people have. And I think it's, it really, uh, really gets across the idea that in order to learn certain attributes that you need as a Christian, in order to uh, understand certain things, you have to go through suffering. You have to go through sorrow. He says this, quote, You want a crown with no cross. You want a victory with no battle. You want a resurrection with no death. You want a cure with no illness. You want a rainbow with no storm. You want deliverance with no bondage. You want an empty tomb with no Calvary. You want a quenching with no thirsting. You want the promised land with no wilderness. You want your waves calm with no storm. You want revelation with no Patmos. You want a sunrise with no darkness. You want a solution with no problems. You want perseverance with no hardships. You want an upper room with no Gethsemane. All these things here, he's just listing in the Bible, just rattling off that, hey, these were good things. These are necessary things down to salvation. But there had to be suffering. There had to be sorrow to get there. And so is in life. There in 2 Peter uh, 1, look at verse 5. 2 Peter 1, verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall never be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's sort of explaining here the steps of a Christian life, of a Christian maturing, and in the end, he said that the end goal is that, hey, if you can master these things, if you can get these things down, you won't be unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You'll be a, uh, you'll be a valuable Christian who does great things for God, but they involve things. He says, you want temperance, do you want patience? Well, you can't get either of those things without being tried. In order to get patience, you have to have that patience tested. In order to get temperance, you have to have that tested by some things that maybe aren't fun to go through but are necessary. Here's a similar example. In Matthew 23, 23, you don't have to turn there, Jesus says to the Pharisees, here, here he describes what, what's known as the weightier matters of the law, where you had the Pharisees and they had all the little things down and they had all the, all the specifics of the law down, which Jesus describes those things weren't wrong to keep. But they were doing those things and missing the more important things out of God's law. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye have to have done. So he said, all the other things you're doing, you ought to have done those things. There's nothing wrong with that. But you ought to have done those things and not to leave the other undone. And here he says these three things, judgment, mercy, and faith, the weightier matters of the law. And none of these things, you can't have any of these attributes without going through sorrow of some kind. You can't learn proper judgment until you deal with bad people. You're not going to learn mercy until you have people do you wrong and you decide to forgive them. And you can't have faith in God until you're in a situation where you've lost complete control and have no other choice. So all these things here, they're things we need as a Christian. They're things that we we will use, but we have to go through sorrow to get them. Sorrow teaches teaches us very valuable things. You say, well, I don't want sorrow, right? No one does. No one wants sorrow. No one wants difficulty. But the idea here is that you will need it because it will teach you attributes that you will need in the Christian life, especially as the world gets worse and people get worse and persecution uh, arises. These are things that you must have. So it's better to go through the sorrow now and get them 
so that you are prepared when you actually need to use those attributes and rely on them in your Christian life. So first, this afternoon, we see that sorrow, what, what's the, the, sorrow is a gift. It's a gift that God gives us that, that we can learn things from. What are, the, what are the benefits of sorrow? What are the attributes we can get from it? Well, one, we saw that sorrow teaches. Uh, turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. The second thing we see this afternoon is that sorrow reveals. Sorrow reveals. Here's this verse um, I read earlier, but we'll, just, we'll, we'll go through it one more time. Sorrow reveals, look at verse 24. And Simeon blessed them and said unto, unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set, don't miss this, for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. And then look at this phrase he says at the end. Why, why, Simeon, why are all these things going to happen? Why, why are people going to fall? Why are some going to rise again? Why, why is there things that will be spoken against? Why, why, is this, why are we going to see all this happen? He says that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. See, Jesus came to earth, and like Pastor mentioned this morning, he came to divide. He came to separate, essentially, the clean from the unclean, to separate those who believe the truth from those who would not, those who were against it. And so there's a lot of sorrow here. There's a lot of sorrow even in Jesus' life. There's a lot he went through. There's, there's a lot his disciples would go through. There's a lot that Christians would go through um, for centuries after he, he went back into heaven. But you say, what's it all for? What did it do? It, it, it revealed where people were at. It revealed who, who was uh, faithful to God and who was not. The idea being that sorrow will reveal who people really are, including yourself, uh, in, including you know, us in our lives. If we really want to see, um, sometimes it's easy to do. A lot of people will pass judgment on other people, but then they will they will save themselves from that, where they won't look at themselves in the mirror and see where they're at spiritually. We all tend to do this. And so, hey, if you go through a sorrowful time, just with yourself personally, that can reveal who you are to yourself and show where you need to improve in your Christian life. Turn to Matthew 13. Because really, when, when, di- when sorrow happens in someone's life, when difficulty happens, there's really two ways people respond. Either they, it's sort of a fork in the road, and I, I believe God does this intentionally, where he sh- sort of puts people in front of this fork in the road where they, it's, they choose one path or the other. But when sorrow comes, people tend to either run to God and use that to get more spiritual and grow more and pray more, or they can run away from God. They can backslide, they can give up, they can quit the Christian life. Um, it, it, seems, it seems to sort of be like a fork in the road that, that God puts there for people. And so let's look at a good example of this, and let's look at a bad example of this. As sorrow reveals who people are, what are the two ways people typically respond? Well, let's look at a bad example first. You're there in Matthew 13. Look at verse uh, 18. Jesus says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and and on with joy receiveth it. Yet he hath not root in himself, don't miss this, but doeth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution, this is the sorrow, ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Verse 22, he also that receives seed among the thorns, as he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and and he becometh Unfruitful. So, verse twenty-two, we see someone who it was riches, and it was uh, it was kind of the sort of the lure of this world that made him leave the Christian life. But verse twenty-one is something someone who left the Christian life just because of the sorrow that came from it. When tribulation came, when the hard times came, this is the person who went to who took the wrong path. This is the person who ran away from God, who, who, who stopped, who quit the Christian life. Um, you know, and usually good times are even throughout the Bible. Good times are typically cited as a cause for backsliding, and this is true, but so can sorrow. Sorrow can have the same effect if we don't make sure that we respond in the correct way. You don't have to turn there, but I'll give you a good example. In Lamentations 3, 39 through 41, the Bible says, Wherefore doth a living man complain? He's saying, why do, why does a man, why do men complain? Wherefore doth a living man complain a man for the punishment of his sins? Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord, let us lift up our heart with our hands 
unto God in the heavens. Now, sorrow can come as a chastisement of God on our lives, but it can also just come as, as God trying us. And either way, this verse is saying, when these things come, instead of complaining, let's, let's search, let's try our ways, and let's turn again to the Lord. I, I think, personally, I think if anything bad happens in our life, we should take that time, we should look at ourselves and, and reflect on our lives and see, is this something, is this because of something I've done? Is this, is this a, a chastisement of God? Or is this just a trial? But either way, that is an opportunity for us to, to search and try our ways, to look at ourselves, and either way, to turn towards the Lord in that time. It doesn't have to be the judgment of God, necessarily. But either way, respond the right way. Turn to 1 Kings 27. So, sorrow teaches, but sorrow reveals. It will reveal who you really are inside. As the, in the same way as the Word of God, in, more in general, divides people and it reveals who people are. Like in Hebrews it says, uh, the Word of God is quick and sharper than any two-edged sword. And, you know, it reveals the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what the Word of God does. But when you take that and you use that to reflect on yourself, what will it find? What will you find in your life if you use those sorrowful times to learn and to grow. So, sorrow teaches, sorrow reveals. Third this evening, I want to look at this, sorrow humbles. Sorrow humbles. Amen. You're there in 1 Kings 21. So just for context, here Ahab, of course, has been living a very wicked life. The Bible says that up to this point in Israel, there were kings that were worse than Ahab, but up to this point, he was the worst one. He was the worst one they had had yet. He had done all sorts of evil things together with his wife Jezebel. And here the Bible is doing sort of some poetic justice here where currently, if you remember the story of Naboth, where he had him and Jezebel, Ahab wanted this vineyard. He wanted this property that was near to his palace. And the man wouldn't give it to him because he was following the law, the, you know, the customs uh, of, of, the, of the law in Israel. And so... Ahab and his wife end up murdering the man. They end up falsely accusing him. And, and, you know, it was more Jezebel in the sense that she's the one who carried it out. But Ahab, Ahab authorized it, so to speak. He let it happen. He knew it was going to happen. And he, he essentially was a part of this, this assisted murder here of this man. And here Ahab is currently in Naboth's vineyard. This is where he is right now. He has gone to take possession of it. He's in the vineyard. He sort of, I imagine he thinks he got away with it. And I feel like God does this with us sometimes, right? When we think we got away with something or we think we're in the clear, this is when, uh, this is when God comes to rebuke us. Because here Ahab's in the vineyard. He's taking possession of it. He's thinking, finally, I got away with it. And then Elijah comes to him to rebuke him. And Elijah comes to him and he gives him this prophecy of, of your wife's going to die and your whole family's going to be wiped out, this, this curse upon him. Look at verse 27. And, you know, Ahab, some people think he was unsaved. Some people think he was a reprobate. That really is irrelevant here. But just look at verse 27. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard these words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. Verse 28. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou, don't miss this, how Ahab humbleth himself before me. Because he humbleth himself before me. And again, he, maybe he was unsaved, maybe he was more, maybe he had rejected God, he is a reprobate. But either way, this sorrow that was put against him humbled him to the point where God says, because of this, because of the fact that he finally humbled himself before me, I will not bring evil in his days, but in his son's days, will I bring the evil upon his house. God still ended up killing Ahab for his sins. Ahab, Ahab ended up dying just a little while later, but this certain curse of, of his whole family being wiped out, he says, because of the fact that he humbled himself here, I'll at least make it so he doesn't have to see that. That can happen in his son's days. So this is another beauty of sorrow. In general, it will humble you. In times of sorrow, it will, it will, it will bring us off our high horse and it will... Um, it'll, as we reflect on our lives, it will humble us. Turn to Isaiah 57. Isaiah chapter 57. Sorrow will show a prideful person that they're not as great and powerful as they thought they were. This can be with us. This can be with anyone. Because few things will end up humbling somebody 
more than sorrow. There's a lot of things that can cause someone to be humbled. Maybe they, uh, they're rebuked by someone or they hear, they hear the word of God in some way, but few things will do it more than actual sorrow happening in their, their actual personal life. And you say, okay, well, it'll make me humble. What's the benefit of being humble? Why, why is that a good thing? Well, there's a couple things we're going to see in this verse here. But the benefit to being humble is God will revive you. So you've gone through sorrow. Now you're humble. Well, ironically, that humility, the Bible says, will revive you, and it will help end the very sorrow that gave it. Look at there in Isaiah 57, verse 15. Isaiah 57, 15 for thus saith the high and lofty one that, inha- that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. Here's God speaking. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. Notice this, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God says, this is the person I dwell with. This is the person I am with the most. Is someone who's humble, they're contrite, and they are the ones, they're the ones whose spirit I am going to revive. Verse 16, For I will not contend forever, neither will I always be wroth, for the spirit should fail before me in the souls which I have made. This verse reminds me of, uh, I'm forgetting the exact reference, but there's a verse in Psalms where, where David mentions, you know, God, God when he's, when he's uh, testing us or punishing us, he, he takes it easy on us because he remembers, he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. God realizes that if his, if his wrath or his, his trials that he let happen in our life, if he let those go on forever, we wouldn't make it. We wouldn't get through it. Um, and here God is saying that. He's saying, I won't contend forever. I won't always be angry. I won't always be rough. For the spirit should fail before me in the souls which I have made. So ironically, when sorrow happens in our life, if we use that among these other things to humble ourselves, that humility can get us extra mercy from God. And that, that, can, I, that can actually end up ending the sorrow that caused our humility in the first place. You don't have to turn there, but Psalm 51, 17 says this, The sacrifices of God, saying here's what God really wants, are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, that will not despise. I can guarantee you this, I don't know uh, what you may go through in your life or why, but I can guarantee you that if you get to the point where you have a, a broken spirit, I love that phrase, a broken spirit, in your life, where you are at the bottom of the barrel, you are, you are humble, you are brought low, and you have a broken and a contrite heart. It's, here it says, God, he, God will not despise that. God, God will help you in that, in that situation. Humility will do a great job of bringing you closer to God in times of sorrow. And something else I thought was interesting here, I have a quote here from a scientific study just, I just thought this was an interesting study that they did. It's from a scientific magazine. But not only will humility help your relationship with God, but it'll also help your relationship with other people as well. Um, this is a study that they did. I just got this from a scientific magazine. And it says uh, this, quote, In one study, participants who first viewed happy or sad films were unexpectedly asked to go and request a file from a person in a neighboring office, end quote. So basically, they, they did the study where they took Um, apparently in an office setting where they took some people and they had them watch a happy film and some people watch a sad film. And then they had them go just do a routine task of of getting something from someone or asking, getting a file from from somebody else. It goes on to say, quote, their requests were surreptitiously recorded by a concealed tape recorder and analysis showed that the sad mood, because you had some people in the sad mood because they watched the sad film and some people who were in a better mood, a happy mood, It says, analysis showed that the sad mood produced more polite, elaborate, and hedging requests, whereas those in a happy mood used more direct and less polite strategies. So, not just, just in addition to your relationship with God being improved, if you are in a time of sorrow and you can use that to, to, uh, to get humble and to exercise humility, with that humility, you just might find yourself treating other people better and being more polite and being more kind which I thought was, was sort of interesting. So, we were looking at how does sorrow help us? How does sorrow benefit in our lives? Well, the first way is it teaches. It'll, it'll teach us attributes that we will need in the Christian life, that we will use. Um, but in addition to that, we saw it refine, or I'm sorry, it, it, um, it, it, it teaches us, it 
uh, shows us a lot of different things, but it also refines. Sorrow refines. So I want to look at the concept of the purging and refining of a Christian, because sorrow, in addition to everything else, in addition to the humility, in addition to um, showing us who we are as ourselves and is a self-reflection tool, it's a powerful tool that God can use to burn the sin and filth out of our lives. You don't have to turn there, but um, actually turn to Deuteronomy 28. But Job chapter 21 and verse 17 says this, How oft is the candle the wicked put out, and how oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributeth sorrows in his anger. So God can also use sorrow if he's angry with us or, or we have... Because the Bible mentions God, God uh, when the chastisement of God, God doesn't want to punish us, but he does it because he wants to use us for a greater purpose. He wants a clean vessel to use for his work. And so if we have sin or error or problems in our life that are standing between us and goals God has for our lives, God's gonna, God can potentially use sorrow to, and, and even in anger to correct us and to get us closer to the Christian he wants us to be. You're there in Deuteronomy 28. Look at verse 63. Deuteronomy 28, 63. And it shall come to pass, the Bible says, that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. And ye shall be plucked off from the land whither thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people. There's a lot of sorrow here we're reading about. From the one end of heaven, even earth, even unto the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods, as you neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and a failing of eyes, and don't miss this, a sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even, and at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart, wherewith thou shalt fear, in the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. You say, why would God give them sorrow? Just to hurt them for, for no reason? Well, I'll turn to Deuteronomy 4. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 4. God can, in addition to everything else we looked at, God can give us sorrow in our life because he wants us to attain a higher level of spirituality. He has, we have things in our life, because no one's perfect, we have things in our life that, that God wants out of the way. He wants a cleaner vessel. He wants to purge us. And God knows that sorrow with us is a very effective tool of doing that. You don't have to turn there. You should be in Deuteronomy 4. But Psalm 119.67 says this, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Amen. So here the author is saying, you know, I, before I was afflicted, I've been afflicted, but before then, before the affliction, before the sorrow, I went astray. I had issues in my life. I wasn't following God. But now that I was afflicted, now that I had to deal with some sorrow, now have I kept God's word. And there in Deuteronomy 4, look at verse 30. I want to show you that this idea of sorrow refining is actually an enormous blessing in our life if we use it properly. Deuteronomy 4.30. When thou art in tribulation. So just, just highlight this in your Bible. Write it down. This you say, are, are you in tribulation? Well, here's a manual for what to do. Here's direct instructions on what to do when you are in tribulation. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shall be obedient unto his voice. So here again, just as a side note, here we see this is assuming you've taken the right path of the fork in the road. This is assuming that when you get to that sorrow in your life, and there's the option of quitting on God and getting backslidden, or getting closer to God and following him harder, this is assuming that you've chosen to follow God. This is assuming you've chosen to keep his commandments even in the sorrow. Verse 31, For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he sware unto them. For ask now of the days that are past, which were before thee, since the day that man cre God created man on the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven unto the other, whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing, or hath been heard like it. What great thing? Verse 33. Did ever people hear the voice of God, don't miss this phrase, speaking the midst of the fire, as thou hast heard and live. Verse 35, the phrase repeats, 
Unto thee it was showed that thou mightst know that the Lord he is God, for there is none else beside him. Your God saying, you know, maybe you just need to get to know me a little better. Verse 36, out of heaven he made that he hear his voice, that he might instruct thee. There's that, there's that teaches again. And upon earth he showed thee, here's the same phrase, his great fire, and thou heardest his words out of the midst of the fire. You see, at, at this, this, whole, this, this group of verses here, it's all centered around this idea of, hey, when you're in these hard times, when you're in tribulation, realize what a blessing it is and how unbelievable it is and how rare it is that you get to hear the voice of God out of the fire. And obviously, in this sense, they literally heard the voice of God out of the fire. There was a pillar, it was a, it was a, a cloud by day, and it was a pillar of fire by night. They literally heard God speaking to them out of a fire. Think about how amazing it is. But I would profess that what we have is even greater than that. Because although they had a literal fire, they had God speaking to them out of a real physical pillar of fire, we figuratively, figuratively have the same thing. Because there are few places you'll hear the voice of God more clearly than out of the storms and the fires and the sorrow of life. There are fewer times when you'll be paying more attention You'll be listening more closely and following more closely what God wants you to do than out of the, when everything around you is burning and is on fire. What an amazing opportunity as a Christian. Turn to Job 23. Job 23. Job 23, look at verse 8. <clears throat> I think Job put it well here, uh, Job 23, verse 8. He says, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, speaking about God, and backward, and I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. But, so Job's saying, you know, I don't know why God's doing this. I don't know what he's doing or why he's doing. But he says, here's what I do know, though. But, when, but he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, saying, I don't know what's going on, but I know that when it's all over and God's done trying me, he says, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held the steps. See, here's how, here's how we ought to respond when, even if we don't know why God's doing what he's doing, even if we don't understand everything, we need to trust that he knows the way that we're taking. And here's how we should respond. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. <laughs> Notice this, he says, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He's saying, you know, even in the midst of this sorrow and this difficulty, I, I esteem God's word, I esteemed his commandments more than the food I need to physically survive. So, there's a lot of faith here, because it, it does require faith, because in times of sorrow, you're most likely not going to know what's going on. You're not going to, there's going to be probably a lot of uncertainty there in your life. You're not going to, maybe you won't understand why God's doing it. But you can have the assurance at least that when you're, when you, regardless of why you're going through it, when you're done going through it, if you respond correctly, you'll come forth as gold. You'll come forth a better Christian than you were before. Turn to Lamentations 3. Lamentations chapter 3. So, just as a recap, we see that sorrow, the sorrow is a gift. That is the claim I'd like to make this afternoon. Sorrow is a great gift. And here's, what I, here's the points I'd like to convince you of that with. Sorrow, it teaches. We saw that. It reveals. It'll teach you things you need to know. It will reveal where you need to change and reveal who you are and reveal who you should become. It'll humble you which will give you mercy from God and it will help end the sorrow. Sorrow refines in that it will make you better. It will, it will bring you closer to God. It will, it will clean your life up. It will, it will do you good in that sense. But last, uh, last this afternoon, sorrow ends. Sorrow ends. Lamentations 3, look at verse 31. The Bible says this, For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he caused grief, God, will, God may cause grief in your life. He may cause things to happen, whether it's chastisement because we've made a mistake or we've turned against God in some way, 
or whether it's just God testing us and trying us because he wants us to be better. Though he caused grief, it's not, it's not beating around the bush there. Though he caused grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Verse 33, for he doth not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. I think this is important to understand. That if you are going through difficulty, even if we're being punished for, for something we've done or chastised, God doesn't want to do that. God doesn't want to chastise us or punish us. God rather is just get right and not have to, not have to go through the, the chastisement. Even ironically, this is why the Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Ironically, even the reprobate that has rejected God and goes to hell because of his crimes against a holy and a just God, even that reprobate, God at one point just wanted to believe and get saved. That was his plan. God's plan wasn't that someone would reject God. His plan wasn't that someone would choose not to believe. And although they didn't reject him and they weren't reprobate, if they end up going to hell to pay for their sins themselves, that wasn't God's plan. God died. God literally died for them. I remember uh, I was talking years ago, I was talking with someone at work about this, and they said, are you telling me that, that, a, that a Muslim or a Buddhist, who, who they're, really, they're, they're really good, uh, he said, you know, many Muslims I've met, they're really good people. And I've said, I agree. I, I've run into Muslims, and they seem very nice. He says, are you telling me that even that Muslim or that, that Buddhist, they, how is that fair? He said, if they die and they go to hell because they did not believe in Jesus. Uh, would God really do that? How is that fair, he said. And I said, it's fair because even that Muslim, who dies without Christ and goes to hell, or that Buddhist, or whoever it is, God loved that Muslim enough to die for him on the cross. Amen. That Muslim, there's, a, there's so to speak, if you want to think of a physical example, they went to hell and there was sort of a, a get out of hell free card that they just left on the table. God paid for that. God, God purchased that ticket for them. He paid for their sins, and it was all thrown away for nothing because they didn't use it. That's not God's fault. God love that person enough. Even the Jeffrey Dahmers and the serial killer that, that will burn in hell for all eternity, even the, the Hitlers and the Stalins, God paid for their sins so they wouldn't have to go there, but they rejected him anyway. That's not God's fault. So compared to us, we're saved. We're obviously never going to go to hell, but if we come across chastisement or trials in our life, we've got to realize God doesn't do it willingly. He's doing it because we are going to improve out of it if we respond correctly. It's a tool that we can use to become better Christians and, come and, and draw ourselves closer to God. Turn to Isaiah 51. Uh, Psalm 30, verse 5, you don't have to turn there, says this, For his anger endureth but for a moment, and his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. But again, if, if in order for this to apply to us, we have to respond to sorrow correctly. There's no guarantee that, that everything will turn out great and we're going to come forth as gold and we're going to reap all these benefits if we just sorrow came and we just turned our back on God. That's not how that works. You're there in Isaiah. I apologize. Turn to Isaiah 54, not 51. Isaiah 54, look at verse 10. <clears throat> Isaiah 54.10, the Bible says, For the mountain shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. Look, the mountains will depart. The hills will be removed. Sorrow is just a part of life. It will come. But if handled properly, it can be a massive blessing. Look at verse 11. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest and not comforted, Behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires. Skip down to verse 14. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression. This is someone who was once afflicted, who was once tormented and not comforted. In righteousness thou shalt be established, uh, and be, shall, thou shalt be far from oppression. For thou shalt not fear and for, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. He's saying, look, there's going to be persecution. People are going to gather themselves together against you. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the waster to destroy. Verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. For every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, 
thou shalt condemn. But notice this, 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 heri- this is the heritage of not just anyone. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. God's speaking to someone here who is afflicted. They're going through sorrow. And he says, hey, all these blessings are going to happen to you. Um, you know, I'll, I'll get you through tribulation. I'll get you through persecution. But this is the heritage of people who are servants of God, who are serving him in these times. Sorrow will come, but if we can reap the benefits when it does, great blessings are in store. Uh, last place I'll have you turn to this afternoon. Turn to John 16. John 16. While you're turning there, I'll read you Psalm four, uh, 34, verse 17 through 19. The Bible says, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth. Who does the Lord hear? The righteous. And delivereth them out of all of their troubles. It's not saying they're not going to have troubles, but it's saying if they're righteous and they're to God, God will hear. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. There's that humility again. And saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. No one wants that part. No one wants all the afflictions. No one wants the verse that says, hey, you know, are, are you living a righteous life? Well, congratulations, you've won a prize. You're going to go through a lot of affliction. No one wants that. But it says, the Lord delivereth him out of them all. You're there in John 16. As we're celebrating Christmas, I thought this was an interesting example of this, kind of similar with that passage we read in Luke 2. Look at John, 6, uh, John 16, verse 20. So the, the, con- the context is that this is at, he's talking to his disciples, but this is right before the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're sorrowful because they don't understand. They don't know what's going on. They're confused. They know he's leaving somewhere, and they know that it's a bad thing that's happening, but they don't know what. They don't get it. He keeps Jesus talking um, in terms that they won't understand until later. And they're sorrowful. And look what he says to them. He's here speaking about the, the pain he is about to go through. We celebrate Christmas because God had been prophesying for thousands of years that one day someone would come to pay for the sins of mankind. This great promise that God had to do himself because man could not do it. That one day he would come for the purpose of what Jesus is speaking about right here, to be born, to live a perfect life, and to suffer terribly that mankind would have a chance to be saved. Look at verse 20. Verily, verily, that means truly, truly, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament. There's going to be a lot of sorrow you're going to go through. He says, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, You will go through pain. This is going to be hard. This is going to be very sad and sorrowful for you. But your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Similar to that quote from Jack Hiles, you know, you want a you want resurrection. You want a great, uh, great things to happen in your life. You're going to have to go through some sorrow. It's part of life. It's going to happen. You know, in this new year, I I I can't tell you the balance, but there's probably going to be some amount of sorrow that you go through. So when it comes, you know it's going to happen at some point. You know it. It's going to happen. Take that and use it as an opportunity to where, yeah, you may may be sorrowful for a moment, but that sorrow, if you respond right and you utilize that for for the to become a better Christian, that sorrow shall be turned into joy. In the same way, is that all even around the the story of Christmas, there was a lot of joy and happiness to the point where we had the joy of of the entire world having salvation that they did not deserve. In the same way as that required a lot of sorrow, just remember that sorrow will come in your life, but if you can use that to a great advantage, it won't last forever, and it can be a great blessing in your life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.